Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, podcast number two for the Samadhi Project. Uh, here today with Dean Fitzgerald. This one, we've been talking about this for a couple of years, actually. I've known you for uh, pro- pro- probably two years now, and I you know, heard about your journey and the things that you've gone down, and in particular, the one with this, this little child. Um, so it's been a very heartwarming story, and it's, it's been crazy. So. Jeez, I'm nearly getting choked up already just thinking about it. So I will definitely get choked up during this. I know I will. Uh, so fair warning. But ladies and gentlemen, this is Dean and this is Indy. Uh, give us a bit of an introduction about yourself, mate. Yeah. So um, been on the Sunshine Coast for 24 years now. Um, Indy came into our lives over almost eight years ago now. Um, Born, perfectly normal child, thought everything was going good. Um, from six months on, uh, we noticed the hyperextension in the knees. When I got it checked, then it uh, turned out to be hip dysplasia. And then uh, a very long journey escalated from there. So um, many, many hospital visits and specialists. And it, it took us to the point where we had to, to move to Melbourne to to get answers, because Brisbane just didn't have anything for us. So, for those who uh, haven't been following along, uh, Indy has been diagnosed with uh, the abbreviated term is INAT. Uh, so, and I might get the uh, pronunciation of this wrong, but uh, it's infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy. That's it. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, so, basically, what it is, uh, it's a very rare disease, and unfortunately, it's terminal. Um, so. What it actually does is it affects the axons in the the brain. So that's the bit that goes from the nerves in the brain and sends the signals to the Dennis. rest of the body. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, it is a it's a progressive disease. So it's something that yeah. gets worse. And the expected lifetime is, I believe, generally between five to ten years old. Yeah. So you've got your infantile, and then you've got your adult, your teens. So you can get diagnosed from a baby and not live past six or seven or you can get diagnosed from nine and live to 15 16 so it's it's hard either way yeah very hard it's uh yeah it's it's uh, not a not a pleasant thing and i i believe that you know it's it's probably the the toughest experience you know sort of for you guys being being the parents you know you as a parent traditionally we're supposed to to outlast our children you know this is something that i've i've had a conversation with some of my uh friends parents you know who have lost their children to suicide and all that sort of stuff it's something that uh, a parent shouldn't see uh, it's against the law, laws of nature and all that sort of stuff so you guys have had a lot of help and all that sort of stuff but the talk about the journey of of you guys growing up with with indy going through this sort of stuff like um you know how, the hospital visits it's, that's that's a huge one um, yeah i mean uh, brisbane got to a point where we were back and forwards down there when she got so sick to a certain point where they're like oh you need to go down and see the brisbane hospital and this is before they turn into lady slanto so the interchange really messed things up it just felt very poorly operated at that time um they said Oh, she's got cerebral palsy. That was the one step. And then um, a few months later or down the track, they go, oh, sorry, it's not cerebral palsy. It's, it's cerebellum atrophy. So part of her brain is, is not formed and um, never will. Uh, but I've looked into that and saw that a little girl in China was seven years old and she started learning how to walk and talk and she was born with no cerebellum. So I was like, perfect, There's, we've still got a future with this yeah. child. Um, it just, we, we felt a lot of negligence. I hate to say it, but it was, it, we weren't getting any callbacks or follow-ups after um, her hip surgery as well too. Um, pretty much cut both femurs in half, twisted, replated, bottle of oxycodone, sent home three days later. All right. The next call was six months later saying, oh, do you want to pop down and see us? So we took it to court over two years. Like we didn't want the money. We didn't care about the money. We just wanted answers to find out what's happening with our baby. And then we just said, stuff it. We're packing up, moving to Melbourne. Melbourne had the best children's hospital in Australia, if not the world. So 
Moved down there, two weeks later, packed our bags, went to the hospital and we said, we're not leaving until we get an answer. Uh, we sat in that hospital for seven days and then a neurologist walked in and goes, I, I think I know what she's got. Like just looking at it like that, we're like, we spent a good nearly three and a half years trying to find someone and you just go like that, that's, that's what it is. So, uh, infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy, I said, okay, never heard of it. Looked at him and we go, it's terminal though, isn't it? And he goes, yeah, like we could, we could tell. We had that gut feeling. Um, so Beck and I both had to get a blood test done, sent off to America, confirmed that we are both carriers of um, a one in two million chance. So for Beck and I to meet, it was a yeah, one in two million. And then each pregnancy would be a one in four. So um, Ivy was already on the couch there. Um, she was already uh, one and a half before we knew that it was a, um, a genetic disease. So yeah, we were worried for her. And then obviously down the track, if, if Ivy wants children, she'll have to get tested before just to make sure. So, but, um, but yeah. It's, uh, it's a tough journey. Uh, before we sort of go any further, guys, I want to give a bit of a uh, reach out about this sort of stuff. This is something that traditionally, you know, Dean, tattered, muscular bloke, uh, you know, the society tells us that we shouldn't get emotional. I've had goosebumps on me the whole time, like my hairs are sticking up. Um, so this is a tough conversation to have, so please appreciate that uh, we as, you know, Australian blokes, we, we're not supposed to get emotional and we're not supposed to share our feelings and all that sort of stuff, but you can't help but be touched with this sort of thing. So it, don't feel silly if you do, like, you know, especially seeing as this is your own, you know, this is your own blood, you know, it's, a, it's, it's your offspring. So for you going down this sort of a path like, as, as a bloke, how is that, how is your mental health, I guess, you know, how have you held up with it? I know that We've had some conversations when I saw you uh, in at work, you know, we'd, we'd have a chat and I'd always check in and make sure that you're all right. Uh, and I know sometimes you struggle because it was tough and whatever else, it, but how have you dealt with it? Is there anything in particular that you've found that has helped? Like, you know, mental health is such a, an important thing to me and I just want to spread, spread that message that it is okay to talk about it and, you know, to seek help and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Um, I guess it, it, it didn't help me um, at the age of 14, I, I was diagnosed with depression, yeah. which uh, I mean, a lot of people are and not realize like it, it took me a long time. It took me waking up in the middle of the night crying saying, what's, what's wrong with me? I didn't have a, a bad upbringing at all. It was just chemically imbalanced. I just wasn't, wasn't feeling me through that. It should have been the best time of my life at that age, but I was just felt like shit. Um, I did the pills did the psychology, I did all that stuff and I just, uh, it wasn't helping. And then um, fitness, going to the gym. Yeah. As you can see, I, like I work out five days a week and that is, that's my mental escape. I mean, if, if people can't get to the gym, go for a run, go to a swim down the yeah. beach, like what you do, it's, it's, it's freeing up that mind and, and helping you express in a different way. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, medical science uh, research and all that sort of stuff coming out now about how uh, exercise can definitely alleviate, you know, your stress, anxiety, depression, and all those, you know, sort of uh, those negative mental traits. Um, and because it does then release hormones and all those, you know, fun brain juices that we get in our brains. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's something that I've been uh, trying to work on is getting back into the gym because I know that it is definitely going to you know, overall help my, yeah. my mental health. So uh, for you, how have you felt the, the, the healthcare system, I guess, with you know, your own mental health? Like, have you um, like uh, struggled to, to find support or anything like that with anything? Is there um, so something that we can do to help change the system? Like it, it took me a while. I mean, you, you're in and out of doctors. You're trying to arrange your, your 10 free appointments with someone else, uh, with a doctor. Um, and then once it's up, that's up. Yeah. Like, well, what if I wasn't ready? Maybe I still needed to talk to someone. So 
um, I guess there was just uh, some older people in my life that I could turn to and were, were helpful in, in certain ways. But um, And being an Aussie bloke, I, I didn't really like speaking up, but that was the best thing I did. Yeah. To get it off my chest or even just cry to another man. It sounds soppy, but it works. Yeah. It, it, it really does. So, um, yeah, it helped. We've got some uh, big shoulders here, mate. So if you yeah. ever need to, uh, <laughs> you know, you can always lean on these buggers. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, being able to open up and you know, openly talk about your, your mental health is definitely something that, that you know, it, it helps. Yeah, and, and, and unfortunately, as blokes, it's, it is drummed into us to, to I guess, not do that, you know, because we're seen it as a weakness. You know, we, we, we're grown up and if we're crying or something like that, you know, my older brother used to call me a pussy or, you know, something along those lines and you're just like, oh shit, I'm not supposed to show emotion and it's just drummed into us. And that's, you know, I think that plays a huge part as to the, you know, the, the, the death or suicide rate, I should say, of, um, you know, blokes because they just don't open up and they feel like they yeah. can't because they're going to be judged by society. And it's, it's, it's terrible. And those healthcare plans that the, you know, I was speaking to, to someone recently and an 11 year old girl was self harming, uh, when all that we, they could do was give her 10 uh, visits to a psychologist. Yeah. And you, yeah. you think that's, think that's okay? Like it's, yeah, it's uh, a it's big not thing. Enough. It's definitely not. Um, and you know, you might, it might take you, 10 visits to 10 different body psychologists to find one that you actually like and that you you resonate with yeah. because your personality is different to mine so I'm but you know not like that person that you've gone to see and you know I might connect better with someone else and they might hit the nail on the head so which a couple of them were they were just textbook they were just straight out of the book yeah like not even looking at me just oh, okay yeah this is this is what I should say next yeah and they're like oh we'll see you next week I said no you won't yeah <laughs> see you later yeah it's, it's it's amazing like it bl blows me away I uh, the first time I'd actually gone and saw a psychologist was when I moved down to the Sunshine Coast um, uh, about my mental health and um, I went and saw my GP and spoke to her about it um, and she's like cool we'll just go here you go go see this person went so I saw him I think two or three times and I didn't go back because I didn't connect with them and it just you know that then made me a bit off put with the whole system and how it works i'm just like i don't want to go see someone else if it was like that um but it took me going to see my current gp the one that i'm you know doing this you know, i've got this partnership out at tenua i'm building this buddy healthcare center you know i went and saw him and i just saw him out of the blue i just went down to the doctor i was like i just need to go see a psychologist because i wasn't feeling right in my head and he's like i can give you some drugs or i can send you that but he's like let's find the cause of the problem yeah um, and i'm just like all right, so that 15 minute appointment, God bless him, turned into a 45 minute appointment. Uh, and, but you know, I've just now been on that huge journey and that's something that I think we're lacking is we treat depression and anxiety and all these other things as the illness itself. But there's, there's I think there is an underlying issue that, you know, is causing that. So it's more of a symptom rather than the, the end result. So. He's just finding what it is. And that's exactly right, finding what's causing that. So um, is there a way that you think that we can change the system? How, like, you know, is it, is, is it a societal change? Like, is there something that, you know, we'd be able to, you know, here at the Samadhi Project, is there something that we'd be able to do to get the ball rolling? And, you know, talking before we started this, going in and finding more people like that lovely lady you're talking about, you know, who wants to open up a community centre for, uh, you know, uh, the disadvantaged the, children. Yeah, disadvantaged yeah. children. Like, is is what more can we do as a society to do this sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's a start, and I, I feel like it will take a long time to for people to open up. Yeah, like it's um, we just hide this shit and we bury it and try and live with it, or we just don't. It's, but it's yeah, it's trying to figure out uh, how to open up to or get people to open up. Yeah, more than they just go to a doctor. or yeah this is the issue but um, a community centre or the start what that Susie Smith is going to start or hopefully start will be just a stepping stone and we'll make it happen mate we'll, we'll go from there happen. and uh, it will do the coast good I mean if the suicide rate on the coast is ridiculous so let's let's try and bring that down and 
it's it's such an amazing thing to like a stat to think about it you know the the suicide here on the sunshine coast like we're living in paradise you know you think that you'd have no problems in the world yeah uh, but you know the, the suicide rate is just still so high um and it's yeah you know just let down by a crazy society and the way that we've been bred and the way that we've been yeah. told that we should feel and all that sort of stuff like well, that's, I, I couldn't, the tablets, I couldn't deal with it. Yeah. Like it, you're just numbing yourself. Yeah. And then, yeah, it was hard to come off them because you were relying on them so much, but exercise, that's, that's it. That's, that's all that got me away from it and made me feel 10 times better. Yeah. It's awesome. And you've got a slick looking rig too. So, you know, you've got to, there are more, <laughs> more benefits to it. So. Yeah. This is a little Ivy, ladies and gentlemen. This is, uh, you say wave to the camera, say hello. <laughs> it was a birthday two weeks ago, so. <laughs> so, for any of those uh, parents out there, you know what it's like. Uh, so, you can always appreciate a bit of an interruption, it's okay. Um, so, did you find anything, uh, we've spoken about it uh, leading into this, this podcast, um, the, the support groups for men, uh, with terminally ill children, I guess it's, it, that's a hard thing for me to even say. So I, I, I can't even imagine myself in your boots, you know, dealing with this sort of a thing. So going through that sort of stuff, like I'll never even claim to, to understand what you're going through. But as far as support groups are concerned, like, did you find many or? So you've got the, the in-ad page, which is all the families around the world. Yeah. Um, out of probably the 100 families, so Indy's one of three in Australia, or four, four in Australia, right. sorry. Um, 79 to 100 worldwide out of six and a half billion people. I mean, yes, there is undiagnosed ones out there, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's slowly creeping up and it's the more people in the world, the more there's gonna be. Um, I've had one dad reach out to me and he lives in Canada. But, that's it. Um, I'm sure there is more support pages out there, but I've just never, I've never gone to look for it personally. Um, I, I touch base with the other dad in, in Canada every now and then, just seeing how his little boy is progressing. And but, um, but that's it. Yeah, that's so I'm just getting caught up on, but he's seventy diagnoses across, but he the world, the, the world. Yeah, that's. Just goes to show how rare this disease is. So that's that's insane. Um, I think that is definitely something that we need to, you know, further to what our conversation was before. Is um, as a society we need to have whether it's more education, uh, you know, because yeah, this particular disease uh, might be um, or illness or whatever. Um, like it's a very rare disorder, but. I'm sure there's a lot of other ones there as well. Like, oh, you, know, 100%. We need, you know, we need to find those support groups and we need that, whether that can come from the government or, or how it comes about, but we need to have more of an education around that sort of stuff. Not just, you know, for parents in this situation, but for doctors and psychologists and all that sort of stuff to, mm. to say, hey, if you're struggling with that, reach out to here, uh, you know, and maybe that's another little project we can work on uh, is make that, make that sort of stuff more aware. Um, so, last year was a pretty big year for you guys. Uh, I know you guys did some crowd, we're starting to do some crowdfunding for, um, to get a, a wheelchair accessible car. Yeah. Um, so, that took a bit of a crazy turn. It did. Um, give, give us a bit of a rundown as to what, what happened. So, uh, yeah, Beck, Beck was doing the, uh, the fundraising down in Melbourne. Um, so sorry, they they've only just moved back up. Yeah. Um, a few months back because they were living with their mother in Melbourne. Um, and yeah, they had the uh, the GoFundMe account around the same time that Israel Flower had his going, and people thought, hang on a minute, let's put this to a real cause. Um, raised uh, nearly twenty six thousand dollars. Selling them. And yeah, on the Fifi. Box nice. show? Fifi, Fev, and uh, I forget what the other bloke's name was. Sorry, sorry, right. other bloke. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> got a phone call through that morning, and uh, a lady actually donated her Kia Carnival 
decked oh. out with wheelchair access, seat belt, like the whole works ready to go. Because um, it'd been sitting in their garage for a couple of years and um, they had it for just under two weeks before their little boy passed away too. So, um, paint it forward. That's, it's a, it does amazing things um, for you to be able to do that sort of stuff. So, uh, shout out to the family who did that. Uh, that's a hectic story, another one that's buddy making my hair stand up. Uh, so that's that's a legacy for them that they'll be able to, to cherish forever though, you know, and that's something, you know, for their son, um, uh, you know, being upstairs or wh whatever you want to believe in, uh, that's something that they'll be able to look down upon and, you know, be like, we did a very freaking nice thing there. So that's that's unreal. Yeah, no, that's good. It, it, like I was on my way to work, just ball them all, I said. <laughs> so yeah, it was good. That's awesome. So, um, what were their names? Do you remember? Uh, the son. The son's name was Lockie. Uh, so, shout out to you, Lockie. Uh, it's a legacy that uh, you should be proud of, mate. And to Lockie's parents, um, uh, that's huge. I uh, hope this reaches you guys because that's a freaking incredible thing that you guys have done. So, um, it's awesome. And I know it has genuinely changed the lives for these oh, guys. So. Unreal. She just wheels up in it now. Yeah. Which, which is, she's getting heavy. You're a heavy girl. So <laughs> getting her in out of that is, yeah, it's hard. So for now, just easier. Especially for Beck. Yeah. Um, her back's crook as already yeah. lifting her constantly. Like, yes, yeah. I can do it, but it's a bit different. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm uh, happy for them. A quality of life thing for you know, for the three of you, you know, for everybody in the whole family, like, you know, that makes it makes a huge difference. So that's unreal. Um, <laughs> Thank you welcome. for that. <laughs> the input. Uh, so what's next for you guys? Like what's, what's the next sort of stage of the journey? Um, it's, she has been deemed legally blind now and uh, is going deaf, so. They did say that's where it sort of gets towards that the, the end period, but man, she's still got a lot of life in her. I can see a lot of life in her. Um, towards the end, the, the organs shut down, and that's, that's it. That's, um, but in saying that though, two years ago, we had 16 admissions in one year. So um, she had pneumonia twice, tonsillitis like six times, it just anything could take her at any time but she's overcome every single one of them and um, she'll she'll fight through it's because uh, you guys didn't think like that she would last this long right well, I think we'd be here far out what was the I, I guess what was the expectation for like you guys in the past for her lifespan but there was one there um, two years ago that we thought she was, um, she had hypothermia that turned into pneumonia and she had the heat blankets on, drips, everything. We're like, is this it? But once again, she just showed. She, on vital signs, started picking up and we were home a week later. and. We just cherish, I cherish every single day, and I know Beck does, but yeah, yeah I just, um... It's, it's something that's very evident through your, um, through your social media, you know, it's something that I, I pay a lot of close attention to because it's, it's just a, a beautiful message of, of, of just love and, and resilience on Indy's behalf, like, you know, for, for all of you, uh, you know, for Beck and yourself, uh, to, to get through this sort of stuff and, you know, it's, as, as they say, you know, fighting off that black dog, it's, it's not an easy battle. Uh, you know, I've, I've struggled and I've, I've had my difficulties and all that sort of stuff and I haven't had to deal with, uh, you know, the having a terminally ill child and it's just, unfortunately, just a ticking time bomb. It's, yeah. it's just a matter of, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yeah. Uh, so that just, it, it, it's heartbreaking. And like, I mean, the, the stresses of, of having a child with a terminal illness and, and Beck and I separated because of this and um, we just fell apart. Um, just a couple of years and I'm, I'm remarried I've got an, another bub with my new wife and I mean life does go on you, like, no matter how hard it is you, you still got to keep yourself happy as yeah. well too and um, we were just in a rut and had to get out so yeah. I needed to be happier to give her a happier life yeah. or see her life out and stuff so um, 
mentally I'm happy as could be. Yeah. Um, next level. Waking up each day with that gut feeling though of when is it going to be, when is it going to happen, it's just, yeah, it, it dwells but I just look at the positives and the life that we've given her so far and like we've done the Great Barrier Reef, we've done the Wiggles, we've done Play School, we've, we've seen them all, we've done everything. Um, so I hope, and I know she appreciates that too. Yeah. So, yeah. It's awesome to see you guys going out to the park and all that sort of stuff. Like. Uh, you know, it's just, it's definitely, you know, be, be, be a, a shining light in, in her life and uh, Ivy's as well, uh, you know, being, being able to go and spend that sort of time with, with her and, you know, that's, uh, I'm sure that's going to be, that's going to be another hurdle of when, you know, when Indy eventually does pass away, you know, Ivy just losing her big sister. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's, that's another journey that, another story that we could probably, probably share, so... Just, uh, I don't think being a five year old I just don't know what she knows yet and, yeah. and what will happen um, I'm just not ready to ask her yet yeah. but um, yeah. it's, it will be hurting for her too yeah and yeah she, I guess she probably doesn't really know too too much better you know that that's one of the maybe uh, the, the benefits that she has is she doesn't know what it's like other than having this sort of a life so it's they yeah. They develop a, a resiliency then to, to this sort of stuff because they just simply don't know any better. There's something, you know, with, with my work with Heart Kids that I've spoken about with the uh, children who do go through all the heart stuff and everything like that. Yeah, it freaking sucks, but they just show that level of resiliency. They just, you know, it almost, they seem to go unfaced, you know, whereas when I had my heart surgery uh, at 26 years old, I lived a full life and all that, and I, I knew that this freaking was going to suck and all that sort of stuff but those kids like that's one I think uh, benefit that they have and it's not obviously uh, it's trying to to look at the glass half full yeah. rather than half empty um, but yeah they just simply don't know any better and they just they're just tough kids are bloody shitload tougher than I'll ever they be they're human oh, um, adults and they're, yeah. yeah yeah so um what is next for you guys? It's just just continue on the life um, that you're leading and just keep doing your thing. Just take it every day as it comes. Yeah. So yeah. every Tuesday and every second weekend, I have these two. Yeah. And then I've I've got two stepdaughters and a bub together, so I've got the five girls in total. Oof. Jeez, so it is a busy Imagine house. when they're all uh, teenagers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> this is a glutton for punishment. One's already going into a teenager. Oh, yeah. far out. Yeah. Right. yeah. But no, it's good, and I mean they're um, they're very helpful. Yeah, they all um, adore Indy and, and help when they can. So That's uh, awesome. Yeah. And how's the new bub? A menace. <laughs> Absolute menace. How old is she now? Sixteen months. Sixteen months. Far yeah. out. Um, daycare said she's the smartest one in the class. Yeah. Cool. Counting to five. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. That's awesome. She. Yeah. I struggle with that sometimes. Yeah. So That's very impressive. Um. Is there a message, I guess, that you could probably uh, share with anybody else that might be going through this sort of stuff? Like, is there anything that you could say to to anybody who is dealing with a terminally ill child, you know, family? Is there anything like that? Is there something? Oh. Yeah, I mean, uh, the support for the men is is uh, is a bit darker and hidden. Um, yeah. But for anyone that is going through the same thing, um, myself and um, Sam is always happy to talk but I guess actually going through it day by day and I, I, I know what you're going through and and what's ahead of us so um, yeah I'm, I'm always here please message me personally if you want to have a chat and catch up for a drink or whatever yeah Easy. so we're on the Sunshine Coast, uh, and as, as Dan was saying, please don't hesitate. Uh, reach out to the Samadhi page, reach out to me personally, find me on social media anywhere. Happy to help, happy to support. And, you know, if, you know that that's a, can be global, like that's the beautiful thing about the internet. Just uh, a message. Doesn't, yeah. You don't have to be face to face, just no. a message or a phone call. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's huge. Um, that's probably is there anything else that you want to share is there you know, any any part of this sort of uh, journey like you know we've got a few notes here that we you know sort of wrote down um, but is there anything you know 
we'll give you an open mic, mate. If, if there's anything that you want to say to anybody, if you're happy just to wrap it up here, happy to do that. But yeah, the microphone is yours. Yeah. If you want to go for a half hour rant, please, <laughs> please do so. But yeah, if there's anything else you want to add, please feel free to do so. Um, I just want to thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing, man. This is, um, it's next level and like, you will change the world. You it's will. the plan. It is the plan. Yeah. I'm sick of uh, just, uh, it just physically is just hurting me nowadays to, to see and start, you know, with this, this medical practice that we're doing, it's, um, it pains me to hear of all the horror stories of everything that, the, the, the shit that people go through. And some of it, people are just coming up to me and, I don't even tell them of what I'm doing and then they're just like and then they tell me their horror story and I'm just like oh my goodness like um, so please don't don't have to thank me for this sort of stuff like it's it's an honor to be able to come in and come into your home uh, and you know be able to do this sort of stuff and share um, the in a bit bring a bit of awareness to, to INAD uh, and be able to share your story and hopefully this can can reach some people who might be going through the same sort of stuff, men and women, um, and yeah. Good. Happy with that? Let's get it. Come here.